Hello, and welcome to Adventures in Neuropathology with your favorite neuropathologist, Andrea Gilbert. Today, we are going to continue on on our multi-part series uh, of videos covering various topics in uh, neuropathology. Uh, this is meant for board prep and board study. So for those of you who are uh, residents in pathology, neurology, neurosurgery, or anybody else who might possibly be taking a test in the future on neuropathology, or uh, would just like to learn more about neuropathology, this is the video for you. So this video series is going to be focused on um, tumors that arise in familial tumor syndromes. Um, and so that's going to be the focus of this series. Uh, we will have other series coming out with different uh, uh, focus and different topics of discussion. So be sure to subscribe and you can get those future videos. Okay. Let's get started. Okay, so mystery case number four. The question is, name the diagnoses, okay, with an S, and then what is the syndrome? Let's start with the diagnoses first, okay? So the diagnosis here, what do you guys think? There are two major diagnoses here. So, okay, so what are we looking at? We are looking at a sagittal view of the spinal cord axial view and a um, sagittal view here, okay? And what we are seeing is that yes, there looks like there are lesions here. What about these other lesions that we're seeing here? And these other lesions here? What do we think about here? We've got a little bit of a dural tail. Now dural tails are not specific, but they are very suspicious. For what diagnosis? Okay, we've got a lot of lesions here and here and here and here and here and here. So when we, when we look at the spinal cord and we look along the length of the spinal cord, one of the, uh, and, and we see a lot of primary tumors, not talking about metastatic, okay, but primary tumors of the spinal cord and you see them just all up and down the spinal cord. There's two major differentials when you see that primary lesions of the spinal cord just peppered all along the spinal cord. Um, uh, meningiomas and um, peripheral nerve sheath tumors. So peripheral nerve sheath tumors include schwannomas and neurofibromas. Statistically speaking, schwannomas are a lot more common than neurofibromas. Okay, so what do we have here? We've got meningiomas, multiple meningiomas, and we've got multiple of these peripheral nerve sheath tumors. And the fact that this one is involving the internal uh, auditory meatus, or internal auditory canal, uh, what is the most likely diagnosis for the peripheral nerve sheath tumor? A neurofibroma or schwannoma? If we're talking about um, uh, intra-auditory canal tumor. So what would be the most likely diagnosis of those two peripheral nerve sheath tumors? Well, schwannoma. A schwannoma would be more likely, okay? So what do we have here? We've got a lesion, we've got a patient. Now, I'll, I will tell you that this patient on the right-hand side is different from this patient over here, but they both have the same syndrome. So what we're talking about here is we've got um, uh, uh, two patients with the same syndrome, uh, and they both have multiple schwannomas and multiple meningiomas. So this is neurofibromatosis type two. Okay, in neurofibromatosis type two, if you have bilateral vestibular schwannomas, then that is going to be basically pathognomonic for uh, neurofibromatosis type two. Okay, you'll have a lot of schwannomas, uh, 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 and, and oftentimes when you see schwannomas involving the CNS, most commonly it's going to be involving cranial nerve eight, um, but you'll also see them peppering along the spinal cord. Now, uh, you can remember all of these things and memorize all of these things, but I find it uh, easier to remember this mnemonic, which is MISME. So when you think about neurofibromatosis type 2, you want to think about MISME, which stands for Multiple Inherited Schwannomas, Meningiomas, and Ependymomas. Uh, when folks with neurofibromatosis type 2, when they get ependymomas, uh, it tends to be within the spinal cord. It tends to be that very centrally located ependymoma within the spinal cord. You don't as often see them within the head. It's not like the, those big cerebral 
cerebral ependymomas. Usually it's in the spinal cord. So neurofibromatosis type 2, multiple inherited schwannomas, meningiomas, and ependymomas. Okay, MISMI is for neurofibromatosis type 2. Okay. So let's move on to our next uh, mystery case, mystery case number 5. Okay. The question is, what is the most likely diagnosis? And then what is the hereditary tumor syndrome? If this patient were to have a hereditary tumor syndrome, with this diagnosis, what would be the most likely? So first we need to recognize if there's something wrong with the brain here. So what are we looking at? Um, on, we are looking at this brain that has been taken out of the skull and we are looking at the undersurface of the brain, okay? So here we have the olfactory nerves, here is the frontal lobes, here are the temporal lobes, here is the cerebellum here, and uh, the brain stem here, okay? And then right next to the pons and the medulla and the cerebellum, do you see how if you compare the left side and the right side, they're different? Okay. So in this little nook between the pons, which is right here, and the cerebellum, which is right here, this is the CP angle, and we've got a CP angle lesion. Okay, CP angle lesion. And if we were to cut into this tumor, we would see um, um, that this particular lesion has this kind of fleshy, soft mucoid look. And then it's also, you see how it kind of pinches off here at the end, and it kind of pinches off there at the end. Now this has been bisected, okay, okay, so it kind of pinches off here and pinches off there. And then if we look at this microscopically, we can see that uh, it's a spindle cell lesion. It's pretty well circumscribed, and it's got these little arrangements where the nuclei like to line up one after the other, and these are called palisades. So if you think about soldiers lining up in formation or the posts in a picket fence or cigarettes in a pack or uh, test tubes in a rack. Um, all of these things where you've got one item that's lining up one right after the other, right after the other, right after the other. Uh, these are called palisades and, and these are not nice palisades so we call them pseudo palisades. Okay? And so uh, these little arrangements of the nuclei where the nuclei are kind of lining up one after the other, these are called varicae bodies. Varicae bodies, when you hear the word varicae bodies, it should be a knee-jerk gut reaction. Okay, so the diagnosis here is a schwannoma. And these little nubbins here that I was uh, showing you guys, this is the connection to the parent nerve. So the schwannomas, uh, typically you can kind of separate those from the parent nerve the, um, and, and uh, protect the parent nerve, whereas with uh, neurofibromas, you have to cut the parent nerves and you have to sacrifice those nerves, okay? So uh, there is a, a term that is used that, that, um, that I don't like, which is acoustic neuroma. And acoustic neuroma is very often used in the place for vestibular schwannoma. So acoustic neuroma is a double misnomer. For two, for two reasons, it is a misnomer in that it usually is not a neuroma. So a neuroma is a separate entity. It's a separate diagnosis. It involves axons of neurons, hence the name neuroma, uh, peripheral axons of neurons. It's a separate entity, okay? Uh, so acoustic neuroma, it's not a neuroma, okay? And then uh, acoustic implies that it's arising from the, uh, from the uh, cochlear portion of cranial nerve 8. Uh, um, and these tumors do not arise from the cochlear portion of cranial nerve 8, they arise from the vestibular portion of cranial nerve 8. So the, uh, what is the term that is used for acoustic neuroma is better suited to be called a vestibular schwannoma. Okay, so the diagnosis of the lesion is a schwannoma. But if you have a, a situation where a patient has a hereditary tumor syndrome, a familial tumor syndrome, and they also have schwannoma, what is the most likely? 
So, uh, so we talked about neurofibromatosis type 2, and now we're going to talk about schwannomatosis. So schwannomatosis is uh, considered to be uh, NF3, uh, uh, type 3 neurofibromatosis, and um, it is thought to arise via a four-hit hypothesis um, uh, four hit hypothesis that result in the formation of these uh, multiple schwannomas. So the, the first hit is where the person has a germline mutation um, that uh, uh, you lose SMARC B1, that's hit number one. The second action that results in the second and third hit is where there is a loss of chromosome 22 that includes both NF2 and SMARC B1 one genes um, and then the fourth hit and third step is where you have a somatic mutation in the remaining NF gene so it's a four hit hypothesis for schwannomatosis and basically these folks they develop a whole lot of schwannomas like what you would see with neurofibromatosis type 2 except they don't have any of the other typical features of NF2 but they can still have the bilateral um, um, vestibular schwannomas and, and uh, peppering all up and down the spinal cord. Okay. Okay, so that's our review of uh, schwannomas arising in the context of a uh, familial tumor syndrome. If you like that video and you feel like you might have learned something, please feel free to check us out on our website at Adventures in Neuropathology. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. In addition, if you are interested in learning more about neuropathology, um, I authored the, uh, the uh, Neuropath chapter of this new book by Daniel Mays. Uh, this is Surgical Pathology Review. It's chock full of information in a bullet point format, great for uh, review and study, so feel free to check that out. Okay, I'll see you on our next adventure.